Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We still have a few people joining, but we'll we'll get started um, now, uh, as as it's just gone just gone one o'clock. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is a webinar about accessing data you can trust, um, and we'll be covering uh, the themes of uh, geospatial data, authoritative data, uh, and making that available with standards and data quality. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Fiona, who is working the controls. So if you're having any problems with audio or anything like that, please pop it into the chat box and uh, she'll respond accordingly. Um, and we will also be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So please remain on mute whilst uh, the main presentation is going on. And there'll be an opportunity for questions and please type them in the chat box as this just helps for a slightly smoother uh, question and answer session at the end. And any questions we don't get around to answering now, uh, we will follow up with later. Uh, my colleague Dan Warner will enter stage left uh, for the question and answer session. So that we'll have a small panel later on for the question and answers. The session is being recorded. Um, so if uh, you're uncomfortable with that, um, uh, do let my colleague uh, Fiona know. Or if you, if you would rather not be on the recording, uh, you can access a copy of the recording later on. Okay, let's get started. So welcome to this webinar about accessing data you can trust. My name is Phil and I'm a senior business development consultant here at One Spatial. Um, the broad themes of what we're going to be covering in this webinar today is going to be the rise of geospatial data and in particular authoritative geospatial data. And within that we're going to be looking at a definition of authoritative data. We're going to look at the importance of integrating authoritative data with other data sets to gain deep insights and to enable that to happen um, we're going to be then looking at the importance of uh, accessibility to authoritative data through standards and things and then also uh, the importance of data quality i'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes or so with a short demonstration at the end of um, some of the key points that we've been covering and there'll be, as I said, an opportunity for questions at the end. And please put your questions in the questions box and the panel will answer. Uh, this is the agenda I just covered. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So I think we can all agree that over the past two decades, GIS and geospatial data has become ever more part of everyday public life. Geospatial data kind of started out in the form of cave drawings or paper maps, which were the initial stages of people trying to identify what was where, i.e. giving things a place. As surveying techniques improved, these maps became increasingly accurate and were started to be used or continue now to be used as authoritative sources of spatial information in everyday life. For example, if you have a boundary dispute over who owns what bit of the land, you go to the authority of spatial maps to clear that up and resolve the, resolve the problem. In the late 20th century, as technology moved towards being more digital, uh, these paper recordings of spatial data were stored digitally. Initially, this gave us the opportunity to simply pan a digital version of the paper map without the need to store large books. However, as GIS developed, we can start to gain greater insight from the spatial data by running spatial analysis and conflating different data sets. 10 or 15 years ago, we would have been learning in GIS skills in a university class, which people now take as part of everyday life with a smartphone, reaching on Google Maps, for example, just shows how far geospatial analysis and geospatial data has come over the past few decades. Not only has this changed how people are accessing geospatial data, but also how geospatial data is captured. This has created a vast array of different data sets from location intelligence data, collected through people's smartphone use or smart credit cards or the building of open source data sets such as OpenStreetMap. Amongst the rapidly increasing variety of geospatial data sources, we often hear the term now of geospatial data that is authoritative data or the important and trusted data. There is value of using these phrases, phrases such as these, as they highlight that the data we are working with are important to organizations and are key to organizational operations. 
We've seen it many times in our careers where important data has not been maintained to standard, and this can lead to all sorts of problems, such as false positives or missing data when making operational decisions. At a number of conferences I've been to recently, there have been many discussions both on the value of authoritative data and the need to start to improve our collaboration between organisations through partnerships and standards, etc. To manage the rise of global events such as climate change, migrant crisis, and predominantly in the last few months, COVID-19. These conferences have highlighted to me that we need to be clear when defining authoritative data amongst other data sets. As the, these collaboration models start to evolve, it is becoming increasingly important to ensure that whilst we want all data to be of a high standard, why it is important to maintain a high quality of our authoritative data in particular. At the third international workshop on spatial data quality, Kronfevex et al. proposed a new definition of authoritative data. And that is that data provided by or on behalf of a public body or authority, which has an official mandate to provide and sustain it, that is based on a set of criteria to ensure known data quality and that is required to be used or aimed towards extensive use and reuse within the public sector and society as a whole. From this definition, a key point for me is that authoritative data has a mandated use. And it is this mandated use which creates value for authoritative data and that vital importance for its quality and accessibility to be maintained. This mandated use could include in government operations and legal cases, for example, where processes and evidence used to make key decisions could come under immense scrutiny. One may argue that the role of authoritative data has strong connections back to the origins of spatial data provision with the paper maps and providing an undisputed record of what is where. Authoritative data provides a powerful insight into the world it represents in its own right. However, it is often combined with other data sets to gain deep insight into what is happening in the world the authoritative data is representing. An example of this uh, is the continued use of authoritative data amongst other data sets, which is key to many countries in their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are many COVID-19 dashboards which have been developed over the past months, such as the ones on the slide, which are from Ireland on the left and New Zealand on the right, both of which have authoritative data which one spatial help to maintain. These dashboards enable government and public and the general public to monitor the spread of the virus and take the necessary measures. These dashboards are fantastic at disseminating the information and turning often overwhelming large data sets into useful information that can inform difficult decision making. However, they are only as good as the data that they, which they use. And it comes back to the old saying, of garbage in, garbage out. These dashboards are underpinned by good quality authoritative geospatial data. And this is vital for guaranteeing trust in the information provided and giving conf the confidence needed to use these dashboards in life critical decisions. The geospatial authoritative data can be used on different scales, ranging from international data to national data or even local data. However, it is by combining the, the authoritative data with other data sets such as health or demographic data that makes it possible to start pulling out the greater insights with what is happening or what could happen in the future. I'm not sure how things are going in other countries. However, in the UK, one of the major concerns is managing the emerging second wave and localised spikes in COVID-19 cases as we try to maintain keeping the economy going but the virus under control. Spatial trends are key to this monitoring and it will be the authoritative geospatial data provided by the national mapping agencies and other government organisations which, combined with other data sets such as those mentioned above, Will, that will identify where these spikes are occurring and inform decision makers on the appropriate action to take. I don't know how it feels for others on the call, but for me, it feels like this will be the normality for a number of countries for a while, as scientists look to find a vaccine or some other treatment. Therefore, one could argue that the authoritative geospatial data will be at the heart of keeping society, uh, society and the eco economy going through these difficult times. Following on from the above, it is apparent that to meet the increasing demand for authoritative geospatial data, there are two key themes. One is ensuring that the data is accessible to work with and the, with, combined with other data sets. And the other is that, of, that the data is of good quality. 
data, which we will now explore. So ensuring that data, authoritative data is accessible. Many organizations have made their data available via a geoportal, which is a fantastic way to make data available in a flexible way for users to download and use along with other data sets. The geoportal is the physical part of making the data accessible. However, however other, another vital aspect is ensuring the data compli complies with standards such as Inspire to ensure that the data is formatted and structured as expected by the users to use straight away. To make geospatial data available, standards are critical to provide an architecture by which data can be discovered, collected, published, shared, stored, combined and applied. The sixth strategic pathway from the UNGJM summarizes this well. Standards are essentially an agreement between providers, regulators and consumers. They provide rules, guidelines and characteristics that enable connection between systems, data, people, hardware, software and procedures. When applied, standards reduce effort, time and cost of implementing technologies, improve return on investment and help future-proof systems by enabling new capabilities to be added with minimal effects. I really like the figure published in the Strategic Pathway, which summarizes how the correct implementation of standards can lead to benefits we all want to achieve or continue to achieve. You'll see at the top of the diagram, which I've put on the slide, there are four key elements to standards. You've got the physical standards and policies themselves. You've got the technology which help implement those standards. You've got the compliance testing and the certification, which is the authorization that we know that the data meets a certain standard. And you've got the community of practice. And as you look through this flowchart on the slide, it's that fourth element, which I feel personally is easy to forget, but it's actually a really critical part when we're defining these standards to make sure that the data is truly accessible to all parties. You'll see the community of practice uh, is, is key in the guiding principles behind the four elements. You've got collaboration, engagement, um, leadership, governance, all, all of which require in, involvement from those who are using the data, those who are publishing the data, those who are managing and storing of that data, and those who are capturing the data. If all ends of the um, spectrum, meets to help uh, comply those standards, then those standards are going to make sure that the data is available and ready to be used by, by everyone. And then we can guarantee that we're going to be achieving those outcomes mentioned at the bottom of the flowchart, such as minimised barriers to data sharing and integration. And I should emphasise that's not to say that the other aspects such as the, sta the standards and the technology and the uh, certification are important. Though those are also important as well. But as well as standards, we need to think about being geospatially ready and what uh, the term that has been around in the market for a little while now, which is the geospatial data infrastructure. Again, with the diagram on the slide at the bottom of the flow chart is the outcome we all want to achieve, which is economic growth, improved environmental and societal outcomes. But to do that, if we go up a stage, we need to be thinking about innovation, the services that we're providing to society. And if we're thinking about that spatially, we can only innovate really with what we've got. So we need to be ready for that. And if we can only be, be ready by ensuring that our data is uh, fit for purpose and valid. So the flow chart goes all the way back to the geospatial data infrastructure in order to achieve the outcomes that we in order to achieve the outcomes that we want. So I'd argue that the other key theme that is important to authoritative data is that the data is of good quality. Uh, whilst data standards can enable this to an extent, they are ensuring that the data is of sufficient quality to be shared, which can be different to the uh, sufficient quality of representing the real world, which is where the geospatial data infrastructure comes in. A geospatial data infrastructure typically consists of geospatial data assets, such as data sets, registers and identifiers, standards to enable access and interoperability with the, with the data assets, as we've just been discussing. Technologies used to curate and provide access to those data assets. Guidance and policies uh, that inform the use and management of data assets. Organisations that govern the data infrastructure. Communities involved in contributing to or maintaining it. And those who are impacted by the decisions that are made using it. So again, it's that collaborative approach, a bit like the standards. 
The geospatial data infrastructure is the beating heart of geospatial data management, enabling collecting, maintaining, and sharing of data. And it is important to maintain your geospatial data infrastructure much as you would maintain your asset infrastructure in the physical real world. Uh, this includes processes to ensure that data quality is um, maintained uh, within the existing data, as well as new data as it's being added in. Uh, at One Spatial, we, when we're managing data quality in these infrastructures, we take the approach of ensuring that um, data quality is monitored through a positive rules approach, for defining how we want the data to be structured and then running the data through and making sure it complies. The quality of the data is based on how reliable that data is to use. Uh, for example, is the data complete? Are there gaps in your attribution that prevent an analyst identifying patterns and trends? Yeah. Another one could be, is the data current? Uh, we saw an extreme example of decision-making using outdated authoritative data with the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, sadly, in 1999. So you'll see here, we've looked at how data quality as well as um, data accessibility is uh, powerful to ensuring that authoritative data can be used amongst other data sets to gain deep insights and how authoritative data when being published in geoportals should take these two things into account. Uh, one of the things which is always interesting to find out is what, what the market is doing. And so to do that, we're going to have a go and have a couple of poll questions, which we should be putting up on the screen now. So the first question is, do you currently publish your national authoritative data to citizens or other government departments via geoportals? So if you take a minute, uh, please do select yes or no, and we'll wait 10, 15, 20 seconds. And we'll check the results. Okay, have we got some results in? Okay, so let's have a look at the results of that one. Ah, so you'll see, wow, that's huge. So geoportals are clearly a massive thing at the moment. Everyone's, everyone's making their data available via geoportals, which uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. Okay, so the next question then. Are the national authoritative data sets that you maintain consuming source data from other government organisations? Are, are you pulling in data from multiple sources uh, to contribute to the authoritative data that, that you're publishing via the geoportals? So, again, 10, 20 seconds to uh, select yes or no. Okay, so we'll have a look at those answers. Oh no, the graphs are just building up. Okay, here we go. So that's really interesting. So the, the data that's being published is being pulled from multiple sources, and that's that's perfectly understandable. There's various organisations with or departments within organisations that are specialists in their in their areas. For example, uh, in in government departments, you might have coastal specialists who are doing coastal surveys and pulling in their data, and then those who are doing tree surveys and pulling in their data, all to be published through uh, a rich authoritative data set in the geoportal. I believe we have another question. Okay, I think this is the last question. No, it's not. Do, does your organization publish data products that merge your authoritative data with other data sources, such as health and environmental data? Okay, please select yes or no. Just waiting uh, for the last few to come in. Okay, results are coming up. Okay, yes, we've still got we've still got a majority there. That that's interesting. So we're 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 starting to see now the benefits as we were talking about earlier of merging 
multiple data sets um, to gain those deeper insights. Okay, moving on to the next question then. So is your authoritative data maintained within a spatial data infrastructure that ensures compliance with standards? As we were discussing earlier, standards help uh, ensure that um, uh, data is um, able to be shared and used in multiple ways. So this can be a manual process, it could be an automated process. Uh, have you got some sort of way of ensuring that the data is compliant with standards? Just waiting for the results to come in. They're still coming in. Don't worry, it's anonymous, so you can fill up, you can answer as honestly as you wish. Okay, the results are coming in. Wow, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge majority. Uh, what will be interesting is um, uh, when, when, when uh, an appropriate opportunity, perhaps to start discussing uh, different methodologies between um, organisations about how they ensure the data complies with standards. Uh, perhaps this is a workshop that we um, uh, could be organised through one of the various industry uh, bodies, because that'd be really interesting to look into in, in more detail. Uh, next question. just coming up. Is your authoritative data maintained within a spatial data infrastructure that ensures data quality is maintained? So, so uh, similar to the last one, so we're looking now at the, uh, uh, the ensuring the quality of the data, so how well it represents uh, the real world uh, for one that merging the multiple data sets. Okay, just waiting for the last few responses to come in. Here they come. Wow, a massive um, majority. That's really interesting. Again, it would be really good, uh, a bit like the standards, to start maybe have a workshop and start to look at how data quality is um, maintained in the authoritative data uh, so that we can start some knowledge sharing between various organisations especially given how important it is to ensuring that the um, authority uh, to, for the decisions that are being made using the authoritative data. And we've got one more question and then uh, we'll move on to the next set of slides. So do you use data from external sources to identify real world change? And that is change intelligence. So this could be uh, from uh, satellite imagery, for example, uh, to start uh, looking, looking at various changes in your data set or where updates in the authoritative data set need to be made. So again, please select yes or no, and we'll just give everyone a minute or so for those um, updates to come in. I think they're filling up. Nearly there. Wow, massive uh, majority. Again, uh, that would also be just really interesting to start having some workshops. I think I think those polls have um, created for us uh, various different things that we can look at organising for for the geospatial industry uh, to start looking at various knowledge sharing um, workshops or ideas or even sadly conferences if we were able to meet. But really interesting stuff. Thank you so much uh, for your participation in those polls. So if we swap back to the slides now. Are we back on the slides? Give us a second, we're just swapping back onto the slides. I'll start talking anyway, but you'll just have a poll on in the background. Um, the, the next slide isn't needed for a minute anyway. 
So that's all really interesting. It's really fascinating to see what um, you are all up to uh, and the, some of the processes that you've uh, described as uh, being there. What, like I said, it'd be really fascinating to start to have some um, further discussions and some workshops about how uh, you're implementing uh, standards into your data and how you're ensuring data quality. And I think that'd be really good because those of us between the organisations can uh, start to knowledge share and look at um, uh, and exchange best practice. And for those as, te as technology providers, it's also really interesting to start to uh, look at how technology can be, new research and development technology can be done to enhance existing existing practices. So all of the things that we've discussed, uh, standards, role of authoritative data using um, and data quality are, are really good. However, budgets are uh, budgets shrinking. We're you know, coming into a time of economic hardship as a result of the global pandemic. And um, I think the emerging phrase that's on everyone's mind is all of this stuff I really want to do, but securing budgets is really difficult. And this means that we need to find a way to maintain and improve our productivity whilst uh, implementing these things. And at One Spatial, we believe that automation uh, of implementing standards in your geoportal and data quality in your geospatial data infrastructure is absolutely key. Uh, for the past 50 years, we've worked with national mapping agencies to manage the data quality in their geospatial data infrastructures by designing automated job management systems with embedded data quality processes and technology. And we are constantly researching how this technology can be adapted to meet the needs of the changing climate. Every organisation is at different stages in the development of their geoportals, although it seems like a lot of the people on this webinar have uh, already started developing geoportals. However, automation can be included in either an existing infrastructure or part, as part of the design if the geoportal is at the embryonic stage of development. What we feel is needed in either environment is a data quality knowledge hub where data can automatically be validated and cleansed against standards and data quality rules that are written out in plain English to avoid complicated rewriting of code should standards be updated or changed, uh, avoiding the risk of technical debt. By having this process automated, it enables data provision organisations to remove time on, uh, spent on repetitive tasks to focus on other priorities such as researching data requirements from users, uh, capturing data more frequently, uh, working collaboratively on or working collaboratively on policy and uh, standards development. But how can we implement uh, this automation in. Now I have got an example here. If I can have a go at resharing my screen, perhaps that will uh, give, there we go, it will give the webinar system a, a good kick up the backside and start it again. Um, so what we've got here is a video of an example where the the um, uh, the automation of the of the data and we're using a tool here called One Data Gateway uh, as an example of how this could be done. And uh, the, the example that we've got, the scenario that we've got here is we've got a national authoritative data set from Ireland that is um, based on ISO and OGC standards. And it's actually a skin of the earth data set. So i.e. it's one layer um, isolated up. And we've got a new set of uh, survey data that's come in from the field. And what we want to do is we want to validate that against some business rules. Uh, we're using business rules in this example, but you could also validate it against the standard if you wished. And you'll see the business rules on the screen now. And if the data passes those business rules, we're confirming this is of good enough quality and we're going to ingest it into our main data set by cutting out um, the hole in the existing layer, dropping the new survey data in and seeding these all up. And that's actually getting rid of a long manual process and it's also reducing the risk of human error. And you'll see the tool there's got various um, dashboards for monitoring uh, data quality and, and over all the projects. You can start to see if any of your suppliers who are sending data into your authoritative data set are um, it's, uh, submitting frequently wrong data. So you'll see here there's an Esri shapefile of the um, of the data that we're going to be submitting. Uh, you'll see there the skin of the earth. So if you turn layers off there's various holes in the data. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're now use uh, we're now um, we're now a 
they supply it, we're going to submit the data, and it's, as I said, it's an SV shape file. So we drag and drop the data in. Uh, in this case, it's the building survey data there, all zipped up. And we're going to first of all check that the schemas match from the source data to the target data to make sure that um, uh, there's no complications there. You'll see here, we're lucky, they do all match, but if needs be, we can click on review mapping and we can um, we can repoint uh, uh, the schema accordingly if we, if we need to. Uh, but it's all okay, so we're going to continue. So we've now kicked off a workflow where we're going to run the data, we're going to load it up, we're going to check it against those business rules, and use the seven features will be validated and pushed through if they pass. You'll see on the screen that all seven features have passed, and they've been committed through to the main data set. So a process that could have taken a digitizer uh, days and days, and then quite a few quality assurance checks has just been gone through in a couple of seconds. And you should see now on the main data set, if we refresh it, uh, the building data has been loaded up. So by doing this through automation, we're ensuring that data standards and data quality is maintained in our authoritative data sets when we're publishing on geo portals. But we are, um, we're doing it in an efficient and productive manner that, uh, that, uh, that we can, means we can handle all the up and coming economic uh, crisis whilst using the value that geospatial data and especially authoritative data can bring to decision making, especially when it's implemented with other data sets. So to conclude then, what we've looked at on this session is we've looked at the rise of geospatial data and in particular authoritative data and how that's now being used more and more in, in, um, in operational decision making, especially by governments, and how we can gain greater insights from that when we start to combine it with different data sets. We then look at how, uh, the, how we can start making authoritative data uh, suitable and ready to be implemented with other data sets uh, to, to gain these greater insights. And the two key themes we've brought up are making the data accessible through the implementation of standards and ensuring that the data is of good quality through a strong geospatial data infrastructure with uh, data quality rules, uh, rules built in. We've then looked at how can we do this uh, efficiently uh, what with the practice ever increasing pressure on budgets and how automation is going to be a key factor in that. Um, so with that, thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, I do believe we have some questions and I'm hoping that my colleague Dan will appear on my left or, or right on the camera uh, in, in a second. Uh, as, we, as we move to, uh, we've only got time for a couple of minutes of questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions and any that we can't get to on the call, we will follow up with on an email. So, so uh, Fiona, have we got any questions? Yes, so there are a few questions. Um, the first one is, what are your thoughts about the challenges of data quality in the future? Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's an inter interesting question. So um, I think what we're seeing within the industry at the moment is, is a big change in um, taking uh, or using source authoritative data and using that with other sources of data. So that's one challenge is sort of managing that where you've got your existing normally automated workflows to manage the data set that you produce. And then conflating or using that with other sources of data and managing the quality between the two. Um, there's also big changes in how we capture data. Um, you know, I think it's there's been a, a big rise in automation through the capture processes. There's new techniques in capturing that, whether that's through LIDAR, whether that's through automatic feature extraction. And, and that just adds a, a different context to how we need to validate that data. Um, and so that's putting in place or extending existing uh, processes to validate data that's coming from automatic sources. So I think, I think, I think it will always evolve, the industry has always evolved. Um, but I think um, as, as, as time progresses, the need for automation um, is greater, uh, the speed at which data arrives, is captured is greater, and the speed at which data is needed is increasing. So it, it's just wrapping all those changes up into an infrastructure or into a quality framework that can be extended to support those changes, I think would be my Thanks, Dan. Thank yeah. you. And uh, the second question that we have here is, what is the role of authoritative data in the future? Um, so I think that 
probably a bit similar to, to what, I, what I've just mentioned. I, um, I think the current climate with COVID has shown a need to have authoritative data to be able to make decisions that you weren't expecting to make only a few months ago and to use that data in collaboration with other sources of information. And um, I think it's I think what we've gone through is is almost like a bit of a portal view to, to where, where we're going to be in the future. There's going to be changes as a result of climate change that government's going to have to re relatively quickly change policies on. There's going to be potentially um, implications from climate change such as flooding or, uh, or, or just natural disasters whereby there's going to need to be a quicker response um, and therefore having authoritative data to base that response on um, is going to be vital. So I think it's more, more around how you use it with other sources of data um, to generate faster responses but then also to drive policy decisions as, as, as the world changes. Uh, yeah, to build on that, I think it's something that will grow exponentially as people start to use the authoritative geospatial data more and more. Uh, they'll start to see the value and the uh, the, uh, the insights that it can bring, especially as you start to merge uh, different data sets. And so it it will just grow and grow. Great, thank you. Uh, can I just okay, great, thank you. I think that's all the questions that we've had. Um, so all the left of me say is thank you so much for joining us uh, our contact details uh, are were made available in the um, opening uh, emails and we'll also be sending around the recording of this webinar so if you have any further detail uh, or have any further questions sorry please don't hesitate to get in contact and we're more than happy to uh, or in fact very interested to have um, detailed discussions with anyone who's on this call on the topics that were discussed today thank you for your time <laughs>